Martin, can you, before we take the questions from the audience, can you say a little more about how would you define reproduction? Because Matt, Matt Sag's argument was essentially you should define reproduction as almost being the same incorporated within it as a communication to the public. So it's a public reproduction. You seem to be also kind of really using the historical fact of what kind of reproductions existed at the time? For interpreting international law, I think the historical perspective can be much more impactful because it says something about the issues that have been before international policymakers before. So from that perspective, it is difficult to argue that private copying would fall outside the scope of the right of reproduction altogether because this has been discussed as a right of reproduction issue internationally. So uh, that's also the perspective that I'm taking in this article, because I think that's, let's say, um, the most adequate method for finding out what international law really wants to tell us. We have to be really, well, looking at the international consensus that has formed around certain areas of reproduction before, and perhaps to a lesser extent, um, what we personally as academics find the best solution from a policy perspective. Joao, do you want to add anything before we, we turn to some of the questions? I wouldn't go so far uh, as what you're suggesting and, and Matt Sag because of the fact we, we are where we are, right? But I think one way to look at this from a functional perspective is even if there is no public attached to the enjoyment of the work, we can look at the concept of public that's been used in Europe, for example, in a lot of the case law, and the public can be a public that is constituted of individual persons, but that's have sub subsequent or sequential access to the work, right? And I think here, all of it is linked to a purpose of enjoyment or some sort of experiential uh, or experience of the work as a work of authorship. And that doesn't really happen here in the context of computational uses. So I think there's a strong functional argument to carve this out of the reproduction right. And there, there are other possible arguments, but I guess we'll, we'll get to them in the discussion. So I don't want to foreshadow too much. Let's, let's go to Miguel. I think these are super interesting thoughts, and I'm sure there's a lot of interaction with them. Although I really like... Uh what's been laid out about uh, the first two tests, oh, the first two steps of the test. Um, I still have a question about the final step, which looks into the matter of the legitimate interests of the author more specifically. And coming from uh, a civil law, droit d'auteur country, I keep thinking if moral rights could play a role in this definition, if they could find their way in when we consider the legitimate interests of the author. And if so, um, I would like to know if that would possibly pose a problem for construing TDM exceptions in research, because from my experience, I have seen many researchers uh, having feelings of property over their data if moral rights may play a role in this process, I could see that becoming a problem when defining an exception uh, for any given country that hasn't done so yet. This is the first question. We see that even defining whether TDM is a question for copyright uh, is an issue of its own. And I see that several countries have decided in the absence of that sort of regulation to just take matters into their own hands. And so my second question would be, considering that we lack this sort of consensus, and this has repeated not only for temporary reproduction, but I remember that the discussion of the sui generis database protection outside of the EU has had a similar problem, uh, and there is a reasonable resistance to it. Uh, outside of the EU and Korea, uh, do you see that making that harmonization of a TDM exception in an international scope would be possible or even desirable at this point? Thanks so much for the questions. These are these are great questions. The the first one, um, well, brings us back to the fascinating three step test discussion. I mean, once again, um, 
That is a discussion that only becomes relevant the moment we agree that TDM is something that has copyright relevance at all, that, that falls within the scope of the right of reproduction. But let's take this as a starting point and say, okay, if, if things um, develop differently from what I have tried to argue in the article and we arrive at a situation where we have to discuss the three-step test, then I think your point is a very valid one. Like what is the impact of TDM and TDM applications on the individual authors. I don't see direct violations of uh, moral rights um, because in a TDM process, we have a computational analytical analysis and it is only, I think, under very rare circumstances that we would see a final reuse or republication of material in this figure transformed form um, that would really amount to something that uh, violates uh, moral rights. Um, but you have mentioned another broader question, and that is the question, is it really fair if we don't make sure that AI technology leads to a further revenue stream for individual authors. And this is a question that I personally like very much um, because it is conceivable that sooner or later AI technology based on training processes that are based on text and data mining um, will also offer substitutes for human creative labor. And then we have a direct clash between, let's say, labor that is taken over by the machine and no longer generates direct income for authors of flesh and blood. Well, the answer to that is if you want to make sure that there's a revenue stream to authors, you can also do this afterwards. You can, first of all, let the TDM process flow freely and arrive at the most sophisticated AI technology, AI trained um, applications and so on whatsoever. And then you can still impose a levy system or a tax like we do in private copying cases as well on products and services that are finally brought to the market. And you can say, well, if based on TDM training, you create a technology that can really compete uh, with human creative labor, then the moment you bring this to the market and you take away market shares from authors of flesh and blood, then you should pay certain revenue to a social, cultural, whatever fund that supports human creativity. Your second question, um, well, I mean, um, of course, we could say if the right of reproduction does not cover TDM at all, then we have a perfect world at the moment because countries are free to adopt whatever regulatory system they would prefer. And then we see system competition. And in a couple of years, we can find out which system works best and we can base further international harmonization of the most successful systems. At the same time, we see that um, many countries, in particular in the developing world and so on, are hesitant to adopt a certain model if they have doubts that they fully comply with international law. So I think um, for the time being, perhaps an international treaty um, would be a bit heavy because we don't know the different regulatory solutions and impacts and so on so well at the moment. But some more guidance, perhaps in the form of a joint recommendation or an international discussion and consensus on certain approaches could help a lot in arriving at a situation where countries feel comfortable to adopt certain solutions, which could then become more widespread and contribute to a more harmonized and perhaps also with regard to an issue we haven't discussed more cross-border use. So I think also connecting to the previous question and to the point of what, what international law can do, I think you can imagine developing this in a two-pronged two approach, right? You can tackle the problem from two dimensions. One of them is indeed looking at the scope of the reproduction right, and the joint recommendation could very clearly try to address those issues that were left uh, a little bit hanging on the agreed statement to the WCT that are, and Martin mentions in this article, but basically trying to carve out to the extent possible an exclusion from the reproduction, right? And saying certain types of uses uh, that involve computational uses, but not enjoyment would not be covered by the, um, by the reproduction, right? The advantage of doing this is the following. For countries that follow this approach, it's still useful to have an exception and limitation for those uses of text and data mining that would be considered to be covered by the reproduction right. So what you'd have is this kind of system that balances itself out. 
countries that want to take advantage of the subject or the exclusive rights scope exclusion would basically carve out of that scope the majority of acts covered by TDM and those that would not do so would uh, still have an exception that could be broader. Just looking at one side of the problem would not be enough here. It would be quite useful to have both approaches. Try to have a strong TDM exception for those uses that you consider to be covered by the scope of the right and have also a clarification that for computational uses uh, that should not be covered by the right of reproduction. And then countries would play out a little bit with that since this space seems to be available under international law. So that that sounds like a treaty, right? That's not a joint recommendation. The problem is feasibility, right? Uh, let's think about feasibility. What was achieved in the Marrakesh Treaty as a possible blueprint would be something that would apply to cross-border uses. I'm not so sure how effective that is going to be here or how useful. It certainly has some use, but I would, I would go also for something like a model law um, that would be within the space or margin of discretion that international law allows you, give clear guidance and text to national legislators of what they can do. But I can also see the power of a joint recommendation because we must not forget that this thing moves sometimes at a glacier pace, right? I generally think that this project uh, on the right to research actually has in its title, the anchor of the solution, right? Thinking of this just as an exception and limitation is not sufficient. You need to think a bit of it as a sort of quote, the quotation right approach. This has to be a right because the scope is broader there and you can balance it with the right of property that's usually attributed to copyright holders. So I think that is the type of right approach that we should be striving towards. When I was listening to the presentation, I understood that Professor Martin was referring specifically to the TDM per se. But what happens with the reproductions that are made, for example, for creating the corpus that you are going to use for the TDM or actually to verify the, the results? Are these reproductions within the scope of repro reproduction right or do they have the same treatment as the reproduction for the TDM per se? And do we need a specific exception and limitation in this case? I think depending on the definition you have of TDM, right? In, if you look at the definition, for example, in EU law, which I think you've looked at, it's quite broad. So it certainly would cover certain of those acts. And let's leave out of the equation right now database rights. Uh, so I would think that except for verification purposes, much of Martin's reasoning and argument would apply. I think for verification purposes, you would probably would have would need an exception, but I think that's an easy sell in that case because there is clearly no conflict with the three-step test there. Actually, quite the contrary, it would be beneficial for, for rights holders, uh, especially in the scientific research articles and scientific publishers, although they are notoriously difficult when it comes to considering exceptions as a viable option. But I think for the others, it would most certainly cover it. Although the case that Martin is making is much easier for the temporary type or incidental copying. But I think the thrust of it is the functional approach. Is this type of copying, even if for storage within a corpus, if you want to call it that, aim that enjoyment? And if it is not, if it's for a process that would lead to an output, then the focus of the analysis on assessing the scope and the infringement of the right should be on the output side, not on the input side. There is this idea of the work as a work, reproduction of the work as a work. And the idea is that because EU law has a very technical understanding of the reproduction right, almost everything that's a copy in the technical sense ends up being a copy in the legal sense, then a way around it is to import this concept from trademark law, which looks at the one side, there's the scope of the right, and on the other side, there's the infringement test. And even if something would theoretically or technically fall within the scope of the right, it might still not be an infringement. And this part is not harmonized in national laws and, or it's not harmonized in EU law and in, in international law. So you could still uh, actually say this, that for those countries that would consider it to be technically within the scope of the right, the infringement test at national level should set aside the consideration that computational repro use reproductions are relevant uh for for these purposes and actually that's a sort of very technical legal solution but quite elegant to solve the problem
which say, okay, even if covered, it, it's not a problem because it's not infringement. And how would you uh, apply the international framework to that decision by a local jurisdiction? That, I mean, that's a decision by the local jurisdiction, right? I mean, it would be an interpretation of your infringement standard. It's much easier to take import that reasoning and say, let's apply it to exclusion of the scope of the rights because we probably don't want to give WIPO or any other international body the idea of starting to try to define the infringement test because also national member states or contracting states would, would not accept this. But I mean, you, this is the type of thing you can kind of put into the conversation by saying, well, even if you don't want to exclude it or cannot from the scope of the, of, of the exclusive right, you can consider Cons that qualifying it as a non-infringing use. And that, that kind of leaves the door open if you word it well enough. Uh, and this is why I think a recommendation ends up to be being the best approach or a model law where you put this as an alternative provision because that could be put on the enforcement part of the discussion, right? But again, I, I always cautious about this. I think Martin's idea here is the moment we accept that the exception is the only way forward, we're leaving a lot of things on the negotiating table. And one of the things we're leaving is the fact that it is actually, there is actually a good case being made here that the right of reproduction designed as it has been is completely inadequate, right? On the internet and then for digital users, what it matters is whether it is accessed to, to, by a public and it has a sort of monetary value there that competes with rights holders interests. If it's not, is it really copyright's purpose to be, uh, to be regulating this? Is it no more of a jealousy tax, right? There is some money being made there and technically I could reach there with a reproduction right. So I want a sort of revenue stream there. So that type, that type of argument I think is, is kind of easy to make you know, within the purposes of the system. And I mean, I would push for that very strongly other than just relying on the exception route. From a European perspective, isn't, isn't that kind of an idea, just a, a frontal challenge to the way many Europeans think about private use rights? Like why would you have a remunerated private use right? It's an historical reason, right? In the 1950s, there was a lot of case law pushed by a German collecting society, GEMA, that tried to, at a certain point, even to defend an idea that every device would have to be licensed by them uh, because it would allow copying. So the, um, the balance struck there was actually right of privacy at the side that says you cannot go into the private sphere of, of individual users, but there is a recognition that there is a commercial impact, especially in the early times of copying. And therefore we impose this levy system. So the, the, the sort of uncomfortable balance has been for a long time that digital private copying in Europe is remunerated uh, because we tolerate this use, but we recognize that it is an economic impact. Then decades of collecting societies being financed on this basis uh, and the system in place is much harder to change now. And we are extending that system to levies, cloud levies right now. So you can imagine once you go down that path, it's very hard to go back. It's also a lesson in law, right? Once you accept, for example, that this is always going to be an exception and limitation, it's going to be very hard to, to sell the argument of the reproduction right, the exclusion of the scope. So from a policy standpoint, it's important, I think, to attack on both fronts if you really want to be successful, successful here. I think one, maybe a reflection for, for the audience is to think, like, when you think about IP, broadly speaking, right? This is very nice to think just about copyright and we find really nifty solutions to solve it. But the problem is a bit broader because as some authors point out, even when you're allowed under copyright to do text and data mining, you can still clash with the with contractual restrictions or technical restrictions. So from that sense, yeah. you also have the problem of trade secret, trade secret law, right? So I think from that problem, from that perspective, this whole right to research discussion has to be taken as an holistic view. And this is why I think the approach towards the rights or always having this idea that we can discuss these elements, but think of it as a right to research is more promising because you're seeing in the European Union a number of legislative instruments that actually have an underlying right to research, right? The Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, and the AI Act. I mean, all these acts now, everything is an act, but all of them have access to 
to data by researchers provisions, even in the emerging right to repair discussion, this is happening. So I think the solution we find for copyright should be aligned in this sense. And to be aligned, it should be thought of as a little bit more than an exception, or even if as an exception, it should be an exception that stems from a fundamental right. And so the battle should always be this. When you're thinking about this, what are the legal hooks that I can find to infuse these provisions, even as if exceptions or exceptions for course border use or consideration of, considerations of exhaustion, whether their justification should be uh, where we should find the justification for this. And I think a holistic approach really depends on that. I'm more and more convinced of that. So the going back to the to the justification is really important here. So maybe this is kind of the 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 idea I would give you. And in copyright law, I think there is this justification. It's very clear this is the promotion of technological development and the freedom of expression as a guiding principle to design copyright law uh, should play a major role here. I mean one thing that comes across very strongly in in Martin and and your uh, answers and, and, and so on is that a right to research is good, but a specific exception on text and data mining is unlikely to be good. Um, I mean, we're thinking in South Africa, we don't have a, a, a specific exception on text and data mining on the table. We just have fair use on the table. And it seems in supporting, um, you know, a right to research, uh, the lessons are the same in the early days of text and data mining exceptions as that of fair use in general, which is that it's better to have, you know, principles there in tests not specific exceptions because specific exceptions that try to define everything you might want to do with text and data mining do the opposite of what you really want which is to confine the exception to very specific circumstances that might not be general enough i have to agree with that i think we have also some policy people in the audience so they all know for example in europe it's a highly compromised process the legislative process so if you frame it as an exception in a model like such as ours that doesn't have an open-ended clause, although we are very comfortable in civil law countries with uh, uh, open-ended clauses, but traditionally copyright exceptions have been designed without the backing of a general interpretative clause, right? This mixed approach that some authors uh, suggest. So what you're going to have as a result is an approach that through the legislative process is going to include additional conditions. Right. So the outcome of that process is always going to be inferior, I think, or has been proven to be inferior to an outcome where we have a fair use like approach that is more malleable. Because once you are in this exemplary list of provisions subject to uh, the three step test, it's very easy to defend restrictive approaches and you don't have the space available to allow certain uses that you would all have agreed at the beginning should be allowed, but there would be just outside the scope of what the exception allows. So I think even drafting going forward is sometimes easier to think, and this is also for us to think about, Sean, as a group, uh, it's easier to think of open-ended language and go for that, other than to try to stipulate conditions that will only be uh, designed more restrictively as the, the legislative process goes on. So I think this is quite important, and it's a lesson we've learned in Europe and are still learning the hard way. I mean, just to end with this, everyone thought it would be great to have mandatory exceptions. And we end up with a mandatory exception for research purposes that benefits two types of institutions unclear that it applies to applied sciences and a commercial exception that allows opt out that we haven't understood yet, whether it's only through technical restrictions on websites or to terms and conditions. And that anchors to a concept of lawful access that's interpreted in other cases of the court of justice in a recent case, which makes it even harder to understand where technical protection measures provisions apply, right? I mean, for those that are highly steeped in EU law like me, this is fun exercise. But if you're a company trying to do text and data mining, good luck <laughs> or trying to get funding for it. So yeah, less is more sometimes.